Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Freeston, Director of Quality Improvement at the Early Years Alliance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar. Welcome back, looking forward. Uh, again, I'm, joined, I'm ple pleased to be joined by my colleague, Melanie Pilcher. Melanie, please say hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope everywhere is um, cooling down as much as London is now. It's been a particularly hot day. Um, thunderstorms broadcast for tomorrow. Um, and without further ado, we won't keep you uh, longer than we need to this evening. Um, for those of you who have been with us on this long journey of Welcome Back webinars uh, and the resources that the Alliance has made, it's a particularly interesting one today because not only will we be giving you an update on latest government guidance um, and notifications from Ofsted, but we want to hear from you in terms of any experiences you've had in reopening your provision or indeed if you stayed open throughout the lockdown period. This is very much your opportunity to share through us with colleagues across the country, those who are may not be open yet or are planning a reopening, um, and or maybe waiting until September to do so. And so it's an opportunity to share that information. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, Melanie will be leaving, leading us through most of the information today. So my task is to try and um, feed in any questions or comments or uh, case studies that you want to share into the, into the conversation as Melanie speaks. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm still in control of the keyboard. I think Mel, let's um, see. You are. Let's see if I'm on the right screen. Um, for those of you who haven't met us before, met us virtually, obviously, um, me on the left, uh, Melanie on the right, as I'm looking at the screen, just to, to say hi. Um, and really, just to run through the aims of today's session, as I said. Um, when we were planning this um, a week or so ago, we were thinking, what are the latest updates from government? Because there hadn't been any uh, since we last shared a webinar. But then yesterday, as I'm sure you're all aware, we had the latest round of updates from government and Melanie will share that with you. Um, also importantly, to reflect on the first weeks of provision where reopening has taken place, um, how the sector is, is meeting the challenge uh, that we face. Uh, and the opportunity to share that with colleagues who are still in the position of planning their reopening. Um, to consider the main areas of focus for the sector as we move forward, um, I will say on this, um, as a caveat to this, we are not focusing on this session, in this session, on the financial situation concerns mm -hmm. that the, the sector will undoubtedly face as we go forward, other than to say, Hopefully you'll have seen on the national media today a publication by the Alliance of a new report called The Forgotten Sector. Um, I'm pleased to say it received wide ranging coverage, uh, both in print media and um, audio visual. Um, and I would, you can download the report if you go to the Alliance's website, um, because it draws on our experiences of following government policy as we've developed through the, through the COVID-19 crisis, but also draws on financial modelling from our colleagues at CEDA, um, looking at what the implications long term for the sector may be if financial circumstances remain as they currently are. But I have to say that's, that's the plug for the report. And um, whilst obviously people may wish to make comment on that, it's not the prime area of focus for our session today. We are looking at the practice elements. Um, and to share your examples of best practice and anything else, wider concerns you have or challenges that you had not you had not thought about or things that have turned up, your experiences will be very valuable for the people who have yet to, to reopen their provision. So if you feel it appropriate and you feel able to share, um, we would welcome that. And that's a particularly important part of today's session. So. If you're already open, just questions to think through as we're as we're going through the presentations for today. What has your experience been in terms of how are the children, how are the staff, how are the parents? Um, what are your main concerns moving forward? And clearly, we'll put financial elements within that. Um, but again, let's raise our vision broader than that and give consideration to our practice elements. Um, 
what do you feel are the biggest challenges in the coming weeks? And I'll add to that months as well. If you've been picking up the latest government scientific guidance, they are talking in terms of what the implications may be for second waves, um, in terms of into the autumn, into the winter and into next spring. So this is a situation that is going to be with us for a long time. So we need to be prepared for that uh, circumstance and, and plan for it. Um, and this is one, and I hope I've presented this in a way that isn't critical. Um, it has been notable in many of the conversations I've had with practitioners returning, um, settings being closed, that at times there has been an anxiety on the part of practitioners in terms of questioning their own confidence about what they do in terms of good early years practice. And I suppose I was having this conversation with Melanie before we came on air, you remember two two week holidays in the summer. Sometimes you have a real concern as to what you're going back to, what might have changed in the period of time that you've been away from your setting or from your work environment. Um, and just and that is clearly something which is a concern for people who have had a forced ex, um, period of time away longer than two weeks. I mean, we're talking three months now in many situations. And, and either through furloughing or through the setting having been closed. So it's understandable in many ways that people will have something of a confidence issue to just remember that they actually are good early years practitioners. So if you've had anything that you'd like to share in, in that way, then, um, um, then, then you feel able to share, then do please do so. Um, Melanie, over to you, the current state of play. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, okay, so obviously we want to set the context here and as of the beginning of June, we were hearing that just one in 10 children returned to their setting after reopening, um, according to the DfE figures. They've also told us that an estimated 166,000 children were attending an early year setting on the 4th of June, and that's just at 10% of the usual number attending in term time. Now, those figures have doubled since the beginning of May, so if we're assuming as we approach the end of June, they will have gone up again. We can see that we are at least moving forward. Same thing with the number of settings that were open on the 4th of June, that had risen from 25,000 on the 21st of May to an estimated 33,000 by the beginning of June. So again, the assumption is that that will have crept up gradually again. So at that time, it meant that around half of the earliest providers were open and approximately 44% closed. And the, the status of those other settings at the time was not known. And of course, the statistics that we're seeing didn't include any record of the number of settings that have reopened with reduced hours or restrictions on the children that can attend. And as Michael mentioned earlier, the, the situation is evolving rapidly now. Uh, more businesses are set to reopen from the 4th of July. So it's likely that there will be a surge in the demand for childcare places. Um, likewise, we're hearing today about the removal of social distancing in school, um, which again is likely to increase the number of children returning to school. And as yet, we don't quite know what the status of early years settings will be with regard to that. Thank so, you, Mel. Thank can, you. I just, can I just, mm. um, just let's look at that. Am I right in thinking that in, in all the publication that came out in the guidance yesterday, there was no specific reference to early years provision and that that discussion about whether social distancing is necessary in schools was specifically for schools. Is that correct? Yes, at this, at this point in time, yes. Yes, but this guidance is being updated constantly. So, oh. you know, it, it could be changed by, by tomorrow. Well, well and, and again, certainly the argument would hold you know, what suddenly changes for children between, well, there would be children of four in school, children of four in a private yes. and PVI nursery. So the children are the same and the virus is the same. So what, one imagines that that, as you say, that that will develop over time. It will. And of course, the DfE have always said that social distancing is impossible in an early years setting anyway. So when they're now acknowledging that it's actually impossible in schools, too, it's likely that little will change for the time being in early years. Smashing. Thank you. Okay. Did I hear you want to speak to me on? Yeah. Yes, please. So we've been hosting quite a few forum meetings across the country with smaller groups of providers and 
I thought it would be interesting to give you some of the feedback that we're getting directly from providers at the moment. So many of the providers we've been talking to have no set date for reopening still, or they intend to reopen in the coming weeks, and the rest are indicating September. So I'd say for the ones, uh, the majority of the ones are intending to open in, in the next few weeks. Some settings have been unable to reopen due to restrictions that are placed on them, such as being in a shared premises, or the unwillingness of the landlord in some places to actually reopen the building. The uptake has been, I would say, slow rather than low, because the uptake is increasing gradually uh, due to parents' reluctance to send their children back or because they've got other arrangements in place. And, and as this situation evolves, we do see that parents are gaining confidence as they see other children going back, as they see settings advertising their services, using videos to show how they're dealing with, with all the issues that we've got to face at the moment. Uh, the numbers being low in each setting, um, the feedback again that we've had is that this makes it easier for settings to manage those cohorts and the bubbles and we're not actually seeing too many problems there and some staff have been unable to return to work as they are shielding so actually at the moment the numbers are low, there are some staff who can't return and that's kind of balancing things out at the moment. But as you say, as as more workplaces go back from the 4th of July, that, that yes, balance is going to shift, isn't it, really? Yes, and, and they have also, uh, one of the announcements that we're going to see on the next slide actually indicates that with changes to the furloughing scheme, it's going to be easier for people to be unfurloughed and, if necessary, put back on furlough again. So that's going to help a lot. So on that note, if we can move on to the next slide. So uh, on the 23rd of June then, so just two days ago, the government updated their actions for early years and childcare providers during the coronavirus outbreak and the associated guidance. So I've listed guidance here and as Michael said earlier, we will post these slides out to you so at least you'll be able to go straight on to guidance from the links that we've got here. Um, the other point to just mention from there is, as we've said in every other webinar, there is it is really advisable to sign up for the daily updates from the DfE um, and it's the www.government.uk government publications the one that's listed there you can if you go to the DfE website you can sign up and you will get these sent directly on a daily basis yes definitely and and also as Michael said earlier that the um, the government's approach is being very much informed still by the scientific evidence and the government have actually produced or sorry published some more of that evidence as they look at the disparities in the risks and the outcomes from the coronavirus and that's taking into account the age of the people affected the ethnicity of those most affected and and other factors that they've looked at so if we look in a little bit more detail now at what that um, latest guidance actually states if we can just move on then Michael it's been quite a lot to cram onto just one slide, so I'm not going to, to linger on these for too long, really. I just wanted to pull out some of the things that are significant, I think. Um, as I mentioned before, from the 1st of July, employers can bring back furloughed employees back to work for any amount of time while still being able to claim the CJRS, which is the COVID or Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme grant for hours not worked. Um, and the detail is there. So that I think is going to be really helpful for those providers who are really worried about unfurloughing people in order to be able to do some of the things that you need to do in preparation for when you do reopen, um, when there's still no income coming in. And I think that's going to be really helpful. I think that's um, sorry, just to, just to say there, Mel, the, the other point yes. there is, is if, yes, there is an increased flexibility and I think that mm -hmm. is to be welcomed. But I think the other point that the second one there is, is of interest that it only applies to those people who had already been furloughed yes. in the original part of the of a part of the scheme for a period of three weeks. So it's not as though you just if you think of it now, you can put somebody in on a flexible furlough. Yes. I'm afraid yeah. it doesn't work. No, but for those that have been on long term yeah. solo, that's certainly going to make a big difference. We originally had quite a lot of questions, didn't we, about the COVID-19 test uh, being performed on children under the age of five. And the DfE, the government, have now clarified for us that children under the age of five must have their test 
if they require one, performed by a parent or carer, uh, because you know there were quite a few issues over it being quite upsetting for, for young children to have that test performed on them. So that's going to help matters too. Lots of issues for childminders. So again, we've got some clarification here about picking up and dropping off from at school. Walking is preferable, they say, or your private vehicle is also preferable over public transport. So at least we've got a little bit of leeway there. Um, also, they've clarified and they've, quite, they've changed slightly what they've said about vulnerable children in terms of settings being uh, should ensure the adequate and appropriate arrangements to keep in touch with vulnerable children who are not attending, such as by phone, visit or letter, which again, most, most people will have been doing anyway. But this used to, this, this bullet actually used to talk about how providers must work with the local authorities, social workers and other relevant professionals to consider factors such as the balance of risk and so on. So they've actually now put the onus firmly back on the provider to actually maintain that contact with those families. Melanie, can I just use that opportunity to drop yes. in uh, an interesting comment that Sarah Old has sent through in terms of uh, to the question I set about confidence and she picks mm -hmm. up on this issue in terms of keeping in touch and she said if you're still closed connect with your children by zoom phone visits etc and see the joy on the children's faces when mm -hmm. they see you you will soon be rediscover a sense of purpose and confidence in why and how you are doing your job Additionally, parental supervised Zoom play dates are a great way for parents to get an insight into your relationship with their children. And the feedback cannot help but feed your self-confidence. Thank you, Sarah. That, that's how I do. I don't think we could we couldn't have put that better ourselves. So thank you so much for that. Um, wraparound care, there have been again, there was a lot of, of concern over the government's plans for, for wraparound care and what we could and couldn't do. But they have now confirmed in the updated guidance that wraparound providers who are registered with Ofsted or with a childminder agency and run before or after school clubs on school premises or in early years settings can open provided they can follow the protective measures guidance. And they, they are able to operate if they can prove they can do so. So again, okay. time, Melanie, because I have a question yes. from Natalie, and and I'm suddenly thinking I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm trusting you will. I have a member of staff who also works with a childminder. Can mm. she work with us as well, or is this not okay in relation to the mixing of bubbles? The, so the she's, she, she works either with a childminder or as a childminder. So there's two different distinct groups of children, I think is the point. Yes, and originally the answer to that would have been that that should be avoided, but I believe that that's been relaxed slightly. I do know that the very answer to that question is on our FAQs page on our right. website. Thank you. And the other point I will make in general, the whole, uh, from the, from, let's think this through that everything that has been said by government now is no longer it is advisory and we're using our common sense that whole notion of, res of legis restriction is part of the relaxation of the whole lockdown requirements so it is a it is a, a consideration both as a nation with as citizens but also us as practitioners it's how do we make it work as safely as possible Definitely just keeping those key things in mind about what the government's saying about the importance of, you know, minimising the risk of spread of coronavirus. So thank you. Um, and finally on this, there's some additional information about childminder agencies in basically in the Ofsted have um, been written to by Parliament asking the Ofsted to support those childminder agencies to make sure that they can keep operating where they haven't been able to undertake the required number of quality visits that they would normally do and the, there is more information to be found about that on the government's website for child care and early years okay so again um, if we can, oh sorry we have a question from ian and um, as you said as the guidance is only advisory can schools still ban child minders from providing wraparound care and i think that relates back to the previous point you mm. said um, that actually wraparound opening up plans are now considered within that. So I'm not sure if it's a matter of banning, 
yes. it's a matter yeah. of the relationship between the school and the feeder childminder agencies. But uh, my understanding is, and um, I'm looking for mainly for confirmation of the FAQs, that mm. banning should not be the word that is used. No, absolutely not. And there were schools that, that even from the outset of reopening were enabling childminders to, to pick up and drop off. And there was there were schools that were saying no. And what it came down to ultimately was whether how they risk assessed and how they managed the situation in the first place. So I, I've always said to, to childminders who are being told that they can't pick up and, and drop off to actually challenge the school to say, well, come on, let's work together to minimise the risk and see how we can make it happen rather than stopping it from happening. Yes, thank you. Did okay. I just press the screen or not? Uh, um, I can't remember. I, I don't know you haven't. So if we can move on again. Fine. OK. Um, and also, of course, we've got to consider that there hasn't been much coming out of from Ofsted uh, during this time. We do know that Ofsted still have no plans to um, inspect early years settings whilst the, the return, the gradual return to um, full time opening is occurring. But there are a few things that they have come out with. They've asked us, don't forget to notify Ofsted of changes to those people making up the organisation on form EY3A. Uh, really important that we consider that. Childminders, same sort of thing, don't forget to notify them of any changes and childminders use form EY3. And this really is significant at the moment because if you happen to be a committee run group, you know, you may not have maintained that contact with committee members and not necessarily know what's happened, what, how their circumstances might have changed. So really important that we make sure that those people making up the organisation, the registered body, are still the people that were there before lockdown. And if not, please, please remember to notify Ofsted, because as we know from the past, if that's not done, then that does end up in, in a limiting judgment. Um, as and when you are inspected again. Um, and again, with regard to childminders, Ofsted also require notification when anyone aged 16 or over stops living or working in the home where you look after children. So still no word on when they're going to resume inspections. However, they are now doing on-site pre-registration visits for those potential new providers. And of course, we've also got to reiterate that Ofsted will continue to carry out their duty to intervene and take action against providers who are not meeting their registration requirements. So just be aware of that whilst there are disapplications and modifications to the EYFS, actually those duties for safeguarding and meeting all the other safeguarding welfare requirements are still in place and you Ofsted will take action if they believe that's not the case. Okay. okay. Thank you, Molly. Can I just I uh, can I ask one question and then I'll share a couple of worked examples of the great tiny century. Uh, from Karen, do holiday clubs still have to keep to bubbles? Yes, in as much as they can. Yes, they do. Yes. Yes, OK. And just a couple of very interesting points shared, and, and I'll read these out verbatim, if mm. you don't mind, from Zoe. First of all, we reopened with reduced hours and to vulnerable and children of critical workers. I took a week with staff into feel secure with all the operational plans and risk assessments. Mm. Children, parents and staff all engaged and it is going well. Issues moving forward are the space doesn't suit two bubbles. So until we can grow our one group of eight, we are limited. This will clearly make sustainability a challenge. Um, and I think you're right, uh, Zoe, that issue that Melanie was talking about in terms of balance between demand and the bubble mm -hmm. requirements is going to be severely tested and presumably will have to move um, as, as demand increases and the number of children wishing to come back increases. Um, and I'll also share Dawn's uh, very kindly sent through. We've remained open throughout for critical workers, 27 children, extending numbers from the 1st of June. Children have been very re resilient and parents on the whole have been supportive with measures in place. Concerns are that part of the workforce with the key managers on furlough due to setting not being able to access wraparound is for quality management and staff supervisions mm. with limited staff um, with limited staff have been concerned but happy with the procedures in place. We accepted more children from June, 47, well done. Wow. With further children attending on a sessional basis from July. 
We are very concerned that if the 16 children bubble is in place in September, this will not be manageable long term to meet working parents' needs. Uh, that is a message that we are putting to government very strongly, that this is about meeting the needs of parents. Um, and also relating to wraparound, it does say they can operate in earlier settings if they can manage children in the same groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Catherine just said her signal dropped out and she's missed the whole section. Will the recording be made available? Yes, as I said at the beginning, uh, on the YouTube page, hopefully by tomorrow. Um, a couple of questions that have come. I'm sorry to have interrupted your flow here, Mel, but- That's all right. To okay. our audience. Um, do we have to have the same children every day? We have numerous children that don't need childcare every day from Karen. No, you don't have to have the same children every day. Um, you know, that, that would be unworkable. But the, the issue here is about the um, cleanliness, the infection control, your measures that you've got in place for cleaning between sessions, between groups, between activities and so on. And again, this is about how you manage this situation. Um, if, if we just took it as read that we could only have certain bubbles and certain children and we couldn't deviate from that, then there would be no point in anybody operating because financially it would never be viable. So this is about making very best endeavours to minimise risk where you can. Um, I've just had a concern. When Natalie said she can no longer hear us. Um, can people put their hands up if you're still hearing us okay? And I'm rather hoping, in a, in a, I hope this doesn't sound rude, that it's Natalie's problem. Uh, <laughs> you can, uh, yes, those hands are going up. So fine, I do apologise for that, Natalie. Um, but the recording will be available on the YouTube site, etc. And please do get back if your Wi-Fi connection improves. Do you need me to move on, Melanie? Uh, yes, I think I do. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So as we as we move swiftly forward, we're we're thinking about the key considerations now, and it was really wonderful to hear such positive feedback there um, from you, Michael, from the lady earlier who's saying, you know, about everybody's okay, that people are doing really well and they're coping, you know, after those initial the initial concerns and worries. Everybody does seem to be getting on with it, but. I just think that we still need to think about the long term impact, the emotional well-being of children, parents and staff over the coming in weeks and months. It's, it's not so much those children that are with you now or have been with you now, but it's those children who will be coming back to us in the coming months and weeks that we've really got to think about. And the NCB, the National uh, Children's Bureau, have produced a really interesting report that remind us, reminds us that in a lot of cases, babies are arriving into the world without the support of their wider family circle, and many parents and very young children are struggling to maintain their emotional well-being. Supporting their mental health has never been more important. And I think whilst, as we know, um, particularly when children are experiencing emotional <laughs> problems you know they, they don't already always show themselves it's not like seeing the physical signs the emotional signs are often harder to spot so this is about us all being really vigilant and using our observations our routine observations to to really consider how that child has coped during lockdown and how they're coping now with another change um i also would add to that in your reference to the point around it's the children who have not yet come back if we think yes. through if there's it is understandable to consider that children will probably inherit or have their anxiety level influenced by that of their parents hmm. and so the, the children who are already back with us will be coming from families and parents whose level of anxiety has been overcome because they are back in the setting clearly that may not be the case with those who are still due to come back and so there may be um, concerns that way. Um, and I've, if I can just add, this is an in, a particular area of active interest for the Department for Education. Um, we've had num numerous meetings on Zoom, uh, we're living our lives on Zoom, um, to giving consideration to issues such as raised by the NCB. And, and so I would like to offer, if people have particular comments on this in terms of concerns in general, obviously I'm not talking specifics here, but any case studies of how they've addressed 
um, any particular concerns or anxieties that children or parents have. If they can share those, uh, we can feed those into the department. Um, and I would suggest that the easiest way to do it, although it's not listed on the slides, is to email me directly. That's michael.freeston at eyalliance.org.uk. And we will work out ways in which we can um, filter this into the department for their consideration as well. Thank you, Mike. Definitely. Thank you. And I think, yes, it's it's really interesting, isn't it, that a lot of the children we've got now are, are those children of parents who have chosen to send them back. But as more and more businesses reopen, as more and more parents are taken off furlough, you know, th their hands will be forced and they still may be very worried and very reluctant. And of course, that will have an inevitable impact on those children. So thank you. Um, Transitions to school, how and when these will happen, you know, is still a, a question for all of us at the moment. We're hearing of some schools who are getting in touch with parents who are starting to organise some, some visits. Um, so again, it'd be interesting to hear from any of you um, if, if you know of, of schools that are actually taking really positive steps towards, um, you know, their new starters for September. As always, vulnerable children and children with SEND are going to be increasingly of concern to us as we move forward. And then, of course, sustainability and marketing, you know, how, how we actually reignite the sector, if you like, and, and what steps we need to do in order to do that as we try to um, instill confidence in, in parents and everybody, basically, that, that actually childcare is open for business. Okay. Uh, just a question, um, Julia, and it's one, it's not there. Um, do we have the link to the NCB report? I'm assuming just visit the website or is there something specific that I've missed, Melanie? There's two things there. I know there is a link to it on our own website. If you look at our right. news reports, um, you will see there is a link to it on our own website. If not, it will certainly be there on the NCB website. And I would highly recommend that people do read that. Thank you. Uh, you want me to move on? I would, please. But there are a lot of negative things, but there are also a lot of positive things out there. And, and of course, the sector that, that we are so heavily involved with, and that means so much to all of us, we can really be proud of ourselves that we've all got on with our work. You out there have all got on with your work with quiet strength and dignity. So that's something to to be very proud of indeed. We know that in many, many cases, parent partnerships have been strengthened as we support that home learning environment in new and innovative ways. And again, hearing back from what was being said earlier as people were typing into you, Michael, about how delighted people have been to actually receive that contact from the setting um, and how delighted the, parent, the children have been to actually see their, their practitioners face to face. Um, we have had to find better ways of doing things that may well stay. It's something that we in the Alliance have thought about a lot, haven't we, recently? Um, but certainly things like the virtual meetings and the show arounds that people are using at the moment, they're finding they are really, really useful for parents who, in the normal state of things, might be too busy to actually uh, come and look around. So a virtual meeting could help them just just for a virtual show round can help them make that decision whether they want to come and find out more about your setting in the first place. And we're being told, and I was so pleased to hear it again tonight, of an overwhelming sense of relief from practitioners who have been concerned about what reopening would be like. And actually, do you know what? It's been okay. The roof did not fall in. So there is that sense of building confidence amongst providers that we can be really thankful for. Okay, Michael, if we can just move on. I just wanted to, to share with all of you now that um, we've got our own example of good practice here about how people are getting around some of the things that some of the uh, bar barriers that we've got to overcome. So I just wanted us to share this video with you. Michael, if you can press the button. I can press the button. The one thing I realise we haven't been able to road test, Melanie, is whether yes. people can hear it properly. Um, please do let me know and I will try and turn this up as best I can because we've only done it as the presenters. Here we go. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. 
Can I give a commentary, Michael, if people can't yeah. hear it? This is a nursery manager who's just explaining to, to parents and to the children how the children can return to the setting. And you will see they've got these lovely flower pots on the um, fence. And they are, of course, mandatory two metres apart. And each flower pot has a, um, an extract from a book. And if you can't quite see it, I'll just read it. All right, said Gruffalo, and it's gone. But it's just an extract about how the Gruffalo will follow two metres beyond. So as the child reaches each standpoint, they can actually have that extract written to them. Then we've got the example here. She's showing us how we're going to wash our hands. And what I really like about this clip is the wonderful noise that the water actually makes going into that tin bath. And I can imagine children wanting to stay there for more than 20 seconds to actually just hear that, that water. Washing hands, drying hands, putting the paper towel into the bin, of course. Oh, Michael, we seem to have frozen there. Oh, sorry. That's OK. And now where are we going to put our bags? So again, this is so re reassuring for the children who, who will want to know all these things. Where are we going to put the bags? We're going to put our bags down. We're going to say goodbye to mummies and daddies and to our carers here. And then as we come into the outdoor area, there are the staff all ready and waiting for you. And she just finishes by saying how very much they're all looking forward to having the children back in the setting. Uh, we've had such wonderful feedback from everybody about this video. So, and I'm sure you've all done similar ones yourselves. Okay, Michael? Uh, um, yes, thank you. I think the, um, I'm, there was a primary school on the end of my road and, um, and it's had these white lines chalked or painted onto the pavement and that's it and then a sign mm. saying green bubble blue bubble and it's just so insensitive i think and this it's was just it made me smile absolutely when i saw those sunflowers I thought it was magnificent and and, and there there i put there you've got this you have got this because you've all come up with some brilliant ideas i've also heard one idea where when parents have to drop the child off at the gate to the nursery um, children are then able to get onto a scooter or a bike, say goodbye to mummy and daddy, get on the bike and ride up to the doorway where the staff are waiting to greet them. And of course, they're barely giving their parents a backward glance as they do that. So that's another really inspirational idea of, of how to overcome something. So, OK, Michael, it's um, it's well, we're, we're here. If there's anything else that you wanted to to feed in before I actually start to talk about um some of the other resources that we've prepared for you. No? Uh, what have I got? Uh, yes, but, da, 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 da. No, they're the ones I've got at the moment. So you keep talking, I'll see what comes in as you okay. do. Michelle. So as always, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, we've created so many resources for you and we'll continue to do so as you, as you identify the need and most of those resources that we have created are free of charge. Um, new this week, as signed off today, the Welcome Back Family Services. So if you're doing baby and toddler groups, if you're part of the Children's Centre or any other unregistered service, um, for example, a crash, uh, the Welcome Back series has been adapted for your needs as well. We continue to host our online connect events and our virtual classrooms as well that you can tap into. And if you want to know more about those and what's coming up in the next few weeks, I believe there's been two of those events today as well. So we've had really good feedback from those. Uh, just email development at eyalliance.org.uk. And just a reminder, I know Michael said earlier about um, any examples of good practice that you can send to him. So you just would remove development and prefix that instead with Michael Adopt Preston. Um, so do have a look to see what's happening in your area. Those are going out nationally, although they're hosted in, in different areas across the country. They are broadcast anybody, anywhere. And then of course, the members area on the Alliance website is updated daily with the current government guidance. So our FAQs have been updated as of today um, in light of the, um, the revised government guidance I mentioned to you earlier. And we also include our mini guides and our press updates there. So 
we're, we've got it and you've got it, so what could possibly go wrong? Okay, Michael? <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would share that reflection on our sector throughout its history has always had to respond to difficult circumstances. Being recognised as a, as a certain uh, sector in itself is one thing. And, and so I have no doubt that uh, people will be able to engage positively and address this one. Um, I'll just share a comment, and I'm reading this cold, so I hope it's nice, Sarah. Um, hang on, oh, they're all coming in now. Um, it, it has been an unexpected result for me that reopening would help me regain some perspective and control over my own anxieties. It's true we are great at adapting to anything. It's what we do every day that a child is in our company calmly, effectively, and efficiently. Again, you, you've articulated that so, so nicely. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Catherine, how are setting managing, settings managing who are using a shared space, i.e. village halls, with cleaning, accessing, accessing to others, and putting in place permanent fixtures? Um, Melanie, has been, anything been picked up from the Alliance Connect events on this? Uh, diplomatic negotiations, I would suggest. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, people are finding ways around this, and obviously it's different for every sector. In a lot of cases, um, particularly in halls, village halls, community spaces where they're sharing perhaps with the uniform groups, a lot of them aren't back yet. So actually, in those instances, the early years provision is finding it's really nice because they're able to leave things set out overnight instead of having to pack away but of course this is about negotiating isn't it with each other um, and keep talking um, and Julia has sent something in which I think actually probably gives us the content of our next webinar um, can we consider ideas of how we can balance the needs of children with SEND as part of the bubble I've received some feedback from settings who are not able to take these vulnerable children back into their settings once they open to the wider cohort of children. I think that's a particularly pertinent issue, and I think it might well be the subject of what we pick up next, Melanie, unless there's any immediate comments you wish to make. No, I absolutely agree with that because it, it, it certainly is a challenge and more so because um, the, the local authority duties have been, some of those duties have actually been removed or relaxed at the moment. So it's certainly something that, that's on our radar and I think you're right, that should be the focus of our next webinar. Okay, thank you. Um, what about, oh, they're, sorry, they're flooding now. Um, that's um, great. Well, said, oh, sorry, go yes, on. I was just going to um, say that we, these are lovely go. comments that we're getting in and I hope that we can actually collate these comments and share them as well because they, they are really inspiring for me so I'd like to hear all of them. Uh, yeah we get these we can pull them down if people don't mind mm -hmm. um, we, will, we will use these in due course. Uh, Pam has said we have sole use of the village hall at the moment we're doing our own cleaning we'll only be until oh it's moved because somebody else sent me we will only be until sorry only be Oh, I've lost it now because somebody else wrote one and it's coming over. Uh, I think she was saying it was only until September and then things will have to get changed. Putting yes. in place permanent uh, but did you do, sorry, I'm scrolling down. Uh, from Debbie, I reopened on the 15th of June. Parents were relieved and so grateful that their children could come back. I was well prepared and could do my own risk assessments and work out how to reopen safely thanks to all the updates. Oh, lovely. All the updates on guidance from the EYE. I didn't make this up. This is from Debbie and your webinars. So all has gone smoothly. So thank you for your support. You are very kind, Debbie. I'm genuinely reading these cold. Um, we'll we'll take that, Michael. We'll take that. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, Jeanette has said we are working well with our hall. We have exclusive access, which enables us to leave table chairs activities. Are exactly the circumstance you said. So for, for many, it's a, it's a it's a meal wind that doesn't blow anybody any good, isn't it? If if Packaway preschools can actually have a bit of a more of a relaxing time, they don't have to for a short period, then um that must be welcome. Yes, definitely. It's making a big difference to them. It's just one less thing to have to worry about, isn't it? Um, Debbie has shared, we have used pupil premium SEND funding to part fund one to one to ensure SEND children to enable them to come back for those who are not oh. shielding. That's an interesting point. Thank you, Dawn. Um, right, unless, uh, this is the usual bit for those of you who are regular webinar uh, attendees, where I just waffle on for a few seconds just to see if anybody else is frantically typing and they will pop in. Um, but we don't artificially go on too long. Um, so I'll say my thank yous now and assume people aren't typing. 
until I'm proven otherwise. And uh, as ever, I offer my particular thanks to Melanie for the hard work in making the preparations for these sessions. Uh, I will say again that this will be available, the recording, uh, by, to, by the end of the week, and we will email the um, slides to everybody who is registered to attend. Uh, but particularly today, it's always, I'm always very grateful for the comments that come through during these sessions, but I particularly enjoy them today, sharing your genuinely upbeat and positive messages, I think will be really reassuring to those who are still planning their return and fill them with confidence. And I echo Melanie's points in the fact that we will do with this because we always do. Um, so unless there's anything else, Melanie, I'll ask you to say goodbye and I will end the session for everybody. That's great, Michael. I'd just like to wish everybody a cool and comfortable night. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.